We're here with History Happy Hour, and I'm Rick Beyer, and I don't who's this? Uh, Chris Anderson. I, know, it's, I feel like I feel like Ed Morrow calling Chris Anderson in, in London. London. In London, and it's coming through. But okay, Chris Anderson and Chris, what is your cocktail for History My Happy Hour? My cocktail is uh, a lovely twelve-year-old uh, Glenfiddich, courtesy of Paul Woodage. So thanks, Paul. Oh, awesome! And I have an Abbey. I can't get it on here. So there you go. Abbey left. Right. Oh. And I have a um, mug. Oh, gosh. It's mug. <laughs> Woo. Woo. You're going to pour that on your computer. Woo. This is happening live. <laughs> and happening on my lap. And I, <laughs> I got a pewter mug to match the mug in our logo. Because, Chris, we have a logo. That's very exciting. You know, let's Whoa. check it out. History Happy Hour, and we want to thank uh, Lauren Kennedy for making that logo for us. So that was awesome, Lauren. Thank you so much. Um, so now we'll hide that logo and uh, go back to uh, to you and I. I mean, I, and we're experimenting with all sorts of visuals today, cocktails yeah. and visuals. And I wanted to uh, just it's just absolutely, Dorian says that should be uh, Left Brune, and Left Brune is actually better than regular Left. This is only the second best beer. Oh, Neil, good fire. I like that. Good choice. Okay. Um, uh, but hey, guys, post a picture of your cocktails if you can, or definitely post and tell us what your cocktail is, because that might be a whole far more interesting information stream going, <laughs> going on on your screen right there. But... Um, Chris and I are going to talk about the stories of D-Day today, and uh, we just also want to mention that, and I'll put it up here in the bottom of the screen once Chris starts talking, that um, uh, we have an email now for History Happy Hour, so if we don't get to uh, feedback or stuff that you've posted online, you can email us at, it's very complex, but you can probably get this, HHH for History Happy Hour at Stephen Ambrose Tours. Dot com. Yep. And we'll put that up on the screen. So um, uh, our, our topic is uh, stories of D-Day. And Chris, why don't you start out, because I know that you have a, a particular unsung or, or perhaps undersung D-Day uh, hero who you're very interested in. So why don't you tell us about that? Yeah. So um, for those of you who've traveled with me before, you know that I've mentioned uh, this man quite a bit, uh, but one of the unsung heroes call him the architect of overlord that I admire very greatly is uh, General Frederick Morgan. Uh, he is the British officer who plans D-Day or what plans what becomes D-Day. Um, he was a, a relatively obscure um, general officer. Uh, that wouldn't be him though. That's not him. No, That's no, not no. him though. But he's well, very mislabeled folks. See, we're, you know, the <laughs> kinks are still being worked out, ladies and gentlemen. Um, while Rick is sorting that out, um, as you know, uh, yeah, uh, Freddie, um, uh, British officer, he graduates from Woolwich, uh, joins the Royal Artillery, uh, serves with great distinction during um, the First World War. He's mentioned in dispatches a few times. Uh, importantly for the story going forward, he, um, he serves with uh, colonial troops, so he's used to coalition warfare. Um, Stays in the army after the war, uh, spent some time in India, and um, uh, at the start of, well, I should say leading up to World War II, he's, he's kind of appalled by the state of the British military as the Nazis are coming to power and kind of, you know, raising alarm bells all over that nobody's listening to. Um, and he will uh, eventually be sent to France with the BEF. Uh, he's with uh, First um, Armored Division, uh, but he almost has no equipment, so he's involved in that. Uh, involved in the retreat uh, through France okay. um, and then is in England and he he's going to have a variety of postings um, in Great Britain and uh, he will eventually in March of 43 be tapped to um, come to London uh, he reports to uh, Alan Burke and Alan Burke hands him a basically a file um, of after action reports from commander rays and uh, he's told, uh, you need to plan. There you go. That's Freddie. Freddie Morgan. <laughs> you need to plan uh, the largest operation in military history. You need to plan for the liberation of France. Um, you may have 100 uh, divisions eventually, but we can't be sure of that. Um, we don't know where. We don't know when. Uh, we don't know who the commander is going to be. Um, and Brooks' final words are, it's not going to work, but you have to make it look like it's going to work. 
Um, so yeah. So so we don't know anything, uh, and, and and but you have to plan it, not right. knowing what your resources are. And by the way, if I can, I will avoid using your plan. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So with that resounding endorsement, uh, he sets out. Uh, he goes to a place called Norfolk House, and um, he says later that uh, it's a good thing that whoever had been there before left uh, a pad of paper and a pencil because when I got there with my driver, uh, there was nothing. That was it. Uh, just us. Uh, and they set out planning. So it's going to be Morgan uh, that picks Normandy. It's going to be Norman that, uh, uh, Morgan that suggests three beaches uh, first because that's what he thinks he's going to have the troops to do. Um, he's going to decide to pick airborne forces or it's the need to deploy them. Uh, and he's also going to say, based on Britain's earlier uh, accident at uh, Dieppe, that um, we're not going to be able to seize a port, so we're going to have to take one with us. A kind of the germination of uh, Mulberry. Uh, he gets involved in Operation Fortitude, which is the you know the planning to deceive the Germans. Um, he's involved in everything. Uh, as he's getting close to presenting his plan um, to uh, the, the combined chiefs of staff, uh, he gets a note from Churchill, um, and he's told, um, "We don't really want to invade France. We want to continue fighting up through Italy." So. Uh, but we know that the Americans really want this. So what we want you to do is we want you to present your plan uh, in such a way that it clearly won't work so that uh, we can then say, well, sorry, we tried. France won't work, but here's this great plan we have for Italy. Now, Morgan, um, again, he's kind of been, this has been thrust on him. He's a British officer. He served in the British Army his whole career. He's trained, and he's just been given not necessarily an order, but a heavy suggestion from the prime minister about what he wants uh, Morgan to do. And Morgan, uh, to his everlasting credit, um, tips off the Americans. Uh, he says that I, at this point, uh, am commanding um, an allied operation. Uh, and as an allied officer, I'm duty bound to let the Americans let know what one of their partners is doing. Uh, so that when Marshall and Brooke and all the senior commanders get together to talk about uh, what they want to do, um, Marshall's ready, and he can basically um, undo every argument that the British make uh, about winning in France or continuing the fight in Italy. So he not only uh, creates the plan or begins the plan, he saves the plan. Um, and there's a wonderful moment. Uh, I've told many of you about this, but um, in Suffolk House, uh, which is Admiral Ramsey's headquarters on D-Day, um, and where um, the largest invasion map that some of you have seen is um, where Eisenhower is watching the news coming in um, on that, that morning of the invasion. Uh, everybody's watching the invasion map. They're waiting to see what's going to happen. And it's crowded, but Eisenhower is kind of standing alone. And uh, all of a sudden in the back of the room, it's smoke filled. People can hear, excuse me, pardon me, pardon me, excuse me. Somebody's trying to get through a crowd. Um, and a man in a rumpled battle dress uh, which is just kind of a fatigue sort of uniform, not a full dress uniform. Um, yep, there's the map right there. Um, comes up from behind Eisenhower and taps him on the shoulder. And uh, Eisenhower spun around and he had this great glower, scowl on his face. Uh, and then he saw that it was Morgan and his eyes lit up and, and got a big smile. And um, uh, Morgan stuck out his hand and said, Well, sir, you know, congratulations, you did it. Just wanted to say, Good job. Uh, and Eisenhower said uh, something to the effect of, well, Freddie, I should be thanking you. You started it. So I think that's a pretty magic moment. So I think wow. Morgan is somebody that we should pay a lot more attention to. Wow. Yeah. So um, and, and then what 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 happens to him after the war? Well, so, I mean, uh, Morgan um, at that point is he is the chief of staff to the Supreme Allied Commander when he's planning it. Once Eisenhower comes on board, um, uh, Eisenhower is very grateful to Morgan, but he wants Beale Smith, who's been on his staff for a while, to be his chief of staff. So Morgan becomes um, Beale Smith's chief of staff, and he'll serve for the rest of the war in that capacity at Shafe headquarters. Um, he very often gets used to, to smooth over differences or arguments between British and American uh, officers. Um, and I think it's appropriate that uh, at the surrender ceremony in Reims. Um, he's, he's there. He's there. He's, he's at the end of the table, but Eisenhower makes a point of saying he should be at the table. 
Um, wow. After the war, he uh, gets a job uh, with the United Nations uh, Relief uh, Association, and that's the organization that's bringing, you know, leaving trucks and jeeps and bringing supplies to help rebuild Europe. Um, he sees that it's become a front for the Soviet Union, um, and very correctly, but uh, and politically, uh, makes that point and says you're just a front for the communists. Um, and he's asked to retire, uh, and then he becomes for a short while uh, head of um, Britain's nuclear program, uh, and he will. You know, that will be his last public post. But once he's made that decision to basically tip off the Americans, um, he's done in the British Army. Um, Montgomery, <laughs> <laughs> Montgomery uh, says something, paraphrasing it, but he said that um, Morgan considered Eisenhower somewhere on the celestial plane and me several degrees in the opposite direction. So, of course, once uh, Montgomery becomes... Uh, Chief of the Imperial General Staff after the war, uh, Morgan. Well, one of the things that um, so this is so cool that there's so many stories, you know, 75 years out, and I know the various historians who in or who we know, um, you, you keep discovering stories and you keep finding things out, uh, and it's fascinating. I want to thank everybody who uh, continues to join us here for History Happy Hour, and I hope you have a good cocktail uh, with you for this, Scott and Michael and Catherine and Carl and Chip and Neil and everybody else who's who's signing in here to let us know that they're here. We thank you. Um, and I want to also say if we if we touch on something that you have another question on and you want to ask about, you can email us. Did I get the Ooh, email? Uh, at uh, at HHH, what does that stand for? History Happy Hour. There you go, History Happy Hour at stephenambrosetours.com. It is the, the power and glory might be starting to get to us. Um, so I wanted to talk about somebody. Hey, George. Pardon? Yes. Somebody, Sorry. George, much lower on the uh, on the totem pole, uh, but also kind of an interesting uh, and perhaps little known, uh, well, certainly little known person uh, who kind of connects a couple of different dots for me because um, he was a Dartmouth professor and I went to Dartmouth but he also has a ghost army connection, but there's also a, a big D-Day connection. And his name is Went Eldridge. In fact, his full name is Hannaford Wentworth Eldridge. So you're not surprised he went to Dartmouth. But he became Are you a, sure that's him? I am sure that okay, that's him. Right. And I know who the other person was who I said was Freddie Morgan too. It's just not Freddie Morgan. So. <laughs> but is that really you? Is it, well, I wish it wasn't, but I'm afraid it is, yeah. Yes, okay. um, so um, uh, Went Eldridge is a Dartmouth professor uh, when Pearl Harbor happens. And he, like a lot of people, quits his job or takes a leave of absence. And he's going to go uh, uh, be part of the war effort. And he's commissioned an officer in the Air Force. And he arrives, uh, he's shipped out to London with a kind of a headquarters type job. And he arrives in London in 1943, and he has a classic sort of first night in London uh, uh, American officer experience. He and two other officers who've just arrived crash a wedding at a posh British club and pick up a couple of young women uh, at this uh, British club, and then they all go sh shooting off in a taxi to a nightclub. Are these posh women of loose virtue? Loose virtue? Pardon? Are these posh women of easy virtue? Uh, perhaps. Well, one of the women is named Diana Lepore Trench. And that's her married name because she is, in fact, married uh, at this time, although that doesn't seem to matter to, much to anybody in the story. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so they go dancing into the wee hours of the morning at the 400 Club, which was a club in London. Yeah. And then when Eldridge settles down to a very boring job, he becomes the historian for the 8th Air Force. He doesn't like it very much. But it turns out that this young woman he met on the first night, Diana, her stepfather is a muckety-muck in the British military deception effort, part of the London controlling station that's controlling British deception efforts. He's also a best-selling British author named Dennis Wheatley, yeah. not, not well-known in America, but well-known in England. And... Um, 
it's coming up there. They're getting to be about six months before D-Day, and uh, he is trying to make sure that there are, they're going to have to be working with Americans on this big deception they're doing, Operation right. Fortitude. And so he wants to make sure that there's somebody among the Americans who's like smart enough to deal with and that he feels like he can trust. And so he's sort of trying to see if he can suggest someone. And so he says to his stepdaughter, Diana, do you know any bright Americans who can keep their mouth shut? <laughs> Literally word for word what he said. And she said, well, yeah, I do know what. And so that is exactly how Wentworth Eldridge becomes part of the allied deception effort because of the girl that he met his first night in London. Well, can I just interrupt for, for a second? Yes. You gotta say, he looks way too studly to be a professor, you know, he just, that's kind of... Well, and if you, <laughs> if you, if you read, the, if, you, if you read, so let's look at him and not us. Yeah, there we go. Come on. Quick, like, quick you can, you can take it out of the picture. It's good stuff. So, um, he's, um, uh, and, and if you read his unpublished autobiography, which I have uh, been delving into for an article I'm writing, uh, he is uh, definitely considers himself a kind of a play the field kind of guy at this point. But he ends up with Diana at the end of the story. So, but he ends up going to work. He's one of three officers uh, who are coordinating fortitude on the American side. And one of my favorite stories involving this is that he. Um, one of his first jobs is he is providing information that's going to be fed to Garbo. So Garbo, as many people will know, is one of the uh, German agents who's been turned by the British. In Garbo's case, he kind of volunteered to become yeah. a British agent. So the Germans think he's their agent, but he's really a double agent. That's kind of a double cross system. And so Went Eldridge is trying to come up with information that they can feed the Garbo that sounds true but isn't, or is true but it's not important. And he is uh, doing this, but he's very skeptical of whether or not this is going to make any difference. How are the Germans reacting to it? If we don't know how they're reacting, how do I know what to say? And he kind of makes some noise uh, uh, going upstairs. And he gets, uh, uh, he's ordered to report to this colonel. And the colonel's name is Telford Taylor, who later becomes a prosecutor at Nuremberg. But he goes in to see this Colonel and the Colonel very theatrically draws the curtains in the room and he says, Eldridge, if you repeat what I'm going to tell you, you will be shot. Do you understand? Yes, yes sir, sir, Eldridge responded. And he tells him about Bletchley Park and the breaking of the Enigma Code and he introduces him to Ultra, the German uh, uh, intelligence. And so that um, he became, is, is it bigoted? Is that the word? Yeah. If you, yeah. if you, are privy to the very top secret ultra intelligence that we're reading from the from the Germans, um, and he's the only one of the American deception planners uh, before D-Day who's privy to the uh, ultra. Uh, and Eldridge's comment was, upon learning about this, was, "Well, I better stop drinking." <laughs> a, and hanging out with loose loose women at clubs. And B, I hope I don't talk in my sleep. <laughs> was the second one. Anyway, there's a whole bunch more about Wen Eldridge, but that's an introduction. And interesting, as I said, I'm writing an article about this for the Dartmouth Alumni Magazine. And interesting is that Diana also uh, ends up going to work for the uh, SOE, the Special Operations Executive. And so she has some interesting experiences um, there, and that's kind of part of the story as well. So again, uh, sort of people big and small, even before we get to the beaches, who you don't know as part of D-Day. Uh, you ever wonder that if he, so he came back to Dartmouth at the end of the war. He did. So he goes through all of this hair raising stuff, lives through the blitz, secret agent man, and he comes back and he's gonna put up with snot nosed kids like you to teach you uh, about Western Civ. He very intelligently retired <laughs> the summer before my freshman year. So I never met him. Oh. So that was a sadness for me. Uh, and then he ha he got a contract to write up a history of the American side of deception and had a stroke the following year. Oh. And so he survived the stroke and he lived for another 15 years and he wrote his autobiography, but he never kind of wrote the sort of detailed, well-researched history of the American side of deception that he wanted to write. Yeah. So. Huh. That's great. Interesting guy. But he, after all that stuff, he and his wife said they wanted to live on a hilltop and uh, hide from the world. And that's pretty much what they did. A lot of that going around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to quarantine, everybody. Uh, so, uh, and we
we should say hi to Brian Peacock and Eric Flint and Ted Moon and Lisa. Lisa, Lisa really just wants to say hi to George. Yeah, I know. And, and uh, Cindy and um, my sister Catherine says that uh, she's uh, she is she's perhaps uh, giving her way her age there, but she says most of the professors who taught right after World War II were teaching returned soldiers. Well, she's not talking about her professors. She's no. talking about my dad. My dad was a professor in that period, although he uh, uh, had, did not was not a soldier in World War II. But but many of his colleagues were and were at D Day and, and had hmm. fascinating stories. Well, one but of those D Day, D Day, D Day. Well, I mean, you know, the topic of people that we should know more about. Um, we hear the name, uh, but somebody else I'd like to bring up is uh, Bertram Ramsey, Admiral Ramsey. Um, again, most people have heard of him because they've read the caption in a book and it says, oh, that's the Navy guy next to Eisenhower. Uh, British people, English people certainly know who he is, uh, but I don't think most Americans um, really give him much thought. Um, and he's another one of these guys who, um, well, I, I, I said the man matches the moment, but you wouldn't have expected him there. Um, he's uh, uh, born into a very, very important family, born in Hampton Court, there we go, uh, Palace. Um, and uh, very well connected. He joins the Royal Navy. He's commissioned uh, uh, in the Navy, Royal Navy uh, just before the First World War. Um, and he has command of um, uh, basically torpedo boats, uh, the World War I equivalent of a PT boat um, uh, on the Dover station and up around Belgium. Um, and he does that well enough that by 1917, he um, is given command of a destroyer. Uh, and uh, as a destroyer officer, um, he will take part in uh, the Zeebrugger raid and other raids um, as, as the Allies try to get around the, the trenches and get back behind the Germans. doesn't work out, but he spends a lot of time uh, on the Dover station. Um, and he serves there uh, after the war uh, in a variety of posts. And I should say uh, Dover station is going to be that part of the channel, which is going to be most involved in World War II. So Calais, um, Dover, that whole area there, the shortest part of the channel, that's going to be his area of responsibility. Um, and he is there um, when, uh, in 1940, uh, when, when Dunkirk and, and the, the evacuation happens. So uh, kind of the reason he, he struck me as somebody I'd mentioned on this show is he's got a connection to uh, Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain, which I've also been, you know, kind of getting ready for in the hope that that will tour will happen, but um, he's he's there, um, and it's important to remember that up to this point, um, he's he's moderately successful in the Navy, but he's by no stretch a leading light. He's not; he's just another admiral. Um, uh, one of the things I said that was very interesting about him is early in his career, um, he didn't necessarily go for those postings that would have brought him acclaim or progression. Uh, they said he focused an awful lot on uh, logistics uh, and staff work. Not very sexy, but um, kind of important. So he has this background, uh, which has meant for most of his career, it's not going to take him very far, but is going to prepare him for that moment that nobody could imagine was going to happen. And that is the evacuation of allied forces from France after um, the, the German invasion. And so uh, it's from uh, his, his headquarters at Dover Castle that he is going to um, plan Operation Dynamo, uh, which is the evacuation of Allied troops from Dunkirk. Uh, and largely through his efforts, uh, 338,000 Allied soldiers, French, wow. British, Polish, Czech, you name it, are evacuated from Dunkirk. So the reason there is an army, a British army, uh, at the end of all that is because of Ramsey. Um, and I should say, like I said before, I should have mentioned if I haven't, before um, uh, the war, uh, he had retired in 1938 and Churchill actually brings him back as a temporary uh, temporary position when he has this. So um, he's there, he stays on Dover um, and he's there during that period uh, leading up to the Battle of Britain. He's there uh, you know, during that um, uh, commanding the Dover Station, and he gets involved in a lot of the naval actions there, and then he is going to be, because he's planned 
this evacuation operation dynamo which logistically is so tricky um he will get involved in the planning for the invasion of north africa uh and then later the landings at sicily so uh much like eisenhower um he comes from relative obscurity um through um circumstance but also ability and skill he's the man that, that you need to command um uh, naval forces the largest most complex naval operation ever planned uh so and he just, and, and he just keeps he just keeps doing landing after landing so correct he has, he has skill all the way along right and so you know he builds on us um uh there's um i want to saw somebody had posted a question uh, i want to make sure i see who where it went but somebody oh mike uh, mentions that during the course of the planning of um for all of this he had a somewhat tense relationship with uh some of the american admirals um he did not get along well with uh, a lot of the american admirals assigned to the, to the overlord plan um and he conflicted with admiral king quite a bit uh, who command, of course, U.S. naval forces. So there was a lot of um, argument and politicking and, you know, what have you. But he's another one of those guys, much like Eisenhower, um, who said, you know, this this has to work. Uh, if this doesn't work, the consequences are we don't even want to think about. Um, uh, I was I was rereading an interview with one of the, um, the women who worked on his staff, and they said he was very austere and very committed, uh, wasn't very warm and fuzzy. Um, they said that, uh, uh, but he trusted his work. He's trusted his people. So they said that he would go off and plan big things and think deep thoughts, give the order, and then let his, his subordinates do it. So he commands, uh, obviously, uh, the Normandy landings uh, go as, as they should have. Um, and uh, he will be one of the people that is whispering in Eisenhower's ear and basically screaming at Montgomery saying, um, you have to take the Shelf Estuary because, you know, we've talked about as the Allied armies advance across Europe, um, there's that debate about single front, uh, single thrust, broad front, uh, the whole market card thing. We'll get to that later. Um, and Montgomery doesn't take, takes uh, Amsterdam, but doesn't take the Shelf Estuary, which means you can't use the port. Can't use the port. Eisenhower has to have it. Big consequences. Maybe we'll do something about that later. Um, and then, um, so he's off going toe to toe with, uh, Montgomery. Um, and then, uh, in January of 1945, uh, he is flying, uh, to meet with Montgomery because despite his, his rank, of course, Montgomery doesn't go to meet anybody. You have to come meet Monty. Famously. Uh, yeah. yeah. So he boards a plane to go fly, uh, just out from just outside of Paris. Uh, he's flying to Brussels uh, to meet with Montgomery, uh, and the plane crashes and he's killed. Um, so, you know, because of that, um, he never writes his memoirs, and we don't really um, get his side of the things. And I think what that means is maybe a little bit the the naval side of the D-Day landings that get talked about. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, we as Americans don't really know that much about him. He's not really kind of part of our consciousness um, because of that, and because he you know, didn't get along well with with King. Um, so I think some just somebody else we should maybe take a second look at. Was there anybody who got along well with Admiral King? <laughs> um, Mrs. King. King is the guy who said, "When the going gets tough, they send for the sons of bitches." And, yeah. uh, and he's another one. He was yeah. one of the sons of bitches they sent for. Uh, the rumor was that he shaved with a blowtorch. <laughs> <laughs> he was kind of a kind of a hard ass, I think. Yeah, you know, and I think you know when he's talking about Ramsey and Eisenhower, they said that you know Eisenhower just had this charm, and he could kind of win people over. Um, and and the impression I get uh, of Ramsey is he wasn't that at all. Uh, but he was just damn good at his job, and people had faith in him. And uh, again, they said he was very austere, um, but they respected him. And obviously, you know, he planned D-Day, so can't argue. Hard to argue with that. So. Yeah, and uh, when you when you read up about Operation Neptune, the the amount of detail in it, and if you when you stand there and just try to take in the detail in that map in Suffolk House of Operation Neptune, it's really really quite extraordinary. 
I want to just call out. Uh, Carl says, Chris, turn on a um, uh, uh, a desk lamp and come out of the shadows. Uh, we're working on Chris's lighting. You know, a, a lighting team will be flying to London later uh, later yeah. this this week to try to fix that. Okay. Um, I've got I've got a, I've got one of these like little portable things I can. You know. You'd have to. It needs to be on your face, Chris. This, oh, is the, this, is, this is what you're missing. Why don't you try holding it here? And I'm sure that's oh, okay. a, a great look. It's like a horror movie, yeah. The Shining, um, the History Shining. Yes, yes. The, that's you can start your own show. <laughs> the History Shining. Um, uh, uh, again, welcome to History Happy Hour. Thank God we're halfway through. You don't have to put up with that much more of it. Um, <laughs> And uh, ha, ha, thanks to everybody who's joined us. And um, we're talking about some stories of D-Day. And let's get to D-Day. I mean, we've done the, the planning and everything, getting ready for it. Um, and uh, uh, so getting to actual D-Day, I want to tell a story about the Rangers and Point to Hawk. Oh, my god, Chris Anderson. My, my, my technical me. department just came in and fixed the light. My 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 wife just handed me a note, but I mean it's it's right that the the, the, the off stage support here is awesome, and we your technical support and my technical they're thinking the same thing. <laughs> they're thinking they're going to take over next week. <laughs> hey, Fred. Um, but um, I want to tell a story about a guy, and and I realized uh, about halfway through my preparations for this week that I was going to come in for an enormous amount of ribbing for the fact that this is also a person with a Dartmouth connection. Oh, okay. okay. But it's a very interesting story. So last year for the 75th anniversary, um, I did a private tour for a few days right up to D-Day. And the woman who was on this tour said, oh, we want to visit Point to Hawk because my uncle was at Point to Hawk. And I said, well, okay, what was his name? And she said, well, his name was Ted Lapris. And I said, okay, um, well, I will see if I can find out anything about Ted Lapras and, and include that when we go visit Point to Hawk. And Ted Lapras turned out to be a really, really interesting person. Here he is. Hey, I've Freddie seen him Morgan. before. Not Freddie Morgan. <laughs> and um, Ted Lapras was a, a Dartmouth 42. He was a three-sport guy, you know, football, uh, hockey, lacrosse, I think. Volunteers, uh, it's up in the Rangers, you know, obviously a tough guy, not a Big, huge guy, probably 5'9", packed a lot of muscle. But Ted Lapras was a lieutenant, and he was the first officer up the bluff when the Rangers took Point du Hoc. And people may remember that this is a was kind of considered a very difficult assignment that all the way uh, at the edge, uh, sort of past the edge of, of Omaha Beach, uh, that the Rangers have to take this gun position at Point du Hoc. They have to climb up these... Uh, 40, 50 foot cliffs to get to the top where the Germans are firing down upon them. They shoot uh, 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 grappling hooks and climb up the cliffs to take it. And it's really one of the extraordinary moments of D-Day. And of course, uh, Ronald Reagan very famously in 1984 referenced the boys of Point du Hoc in his speech uh, uh, on the 50th, 40th, 40th anniversary. And um, and I, I many people have visited there. I'm actually told I saw Paul Woodage said that they've they've restricted access a little bit. Yeah, they they put lots of fencing the, up now. Yeah, and stuff. You can't do everything you used to. But Lapras was the first officer up the uh, um, bluffs. He was there about five minutes up, and he uh, there was an enlisted man who went down uh, went up in front of him, and the rope was cut. So this uh, private actually. Uh, lay down on the rope and held it, and four other guys came up, and Ted Lapras was one of them. He commanded a, a, a company, I'm sorry, a, a, a platoon in E Company of the Second Rangers, and his company is the one that attacked, they landed right by the observation post, right on the point, and they're the ones who attacked that observation post. And if you've visited Point du Hoc, you've almost certainly been in that observation post. It's the kind of the place everybody wants to visit. If you see the damage done inside there, that was done by Ted Lapras and the uh, uh, half a dozen people he had up with, the, with him there in the cliff. And how do I know that's exactly where he came up? I actually was able to go there with this couple that I took there and stand on the spot and say, Ted Lapras came up right here. And how do I know that? And the reason I know that is that uh, 10 years after the war, Collier's Magazine did a uh, article about Point to Hawk. And they went back there, a writer went back with Colonel Rudder, who commanded the Rangers. 
And in that article, which I found, there's a photograph, and there's Colonel Rudder with his son at that point, who's like about 10 years old. ABMC wouldn't allow that right now. No, no. They wouldn't have allowed that for the last 30 years, I think. But you, I don't know if you can read the caption there. He says, uh, there's still a rope here. Uh, it, it's Part of it's cut off. But he says in the caption, that's where Lapras came up. And I just defined oh, wow. that and then to be able to go and stand on the spot with his knees and say, that's where Ted Lapras, you are standing at the spot that he came up. It was, uh, it was very emotional. And it was a very, you know, it's not that he did anything any more spectacular than the other Rangers, but it's always great to be able to put a, a personal face to it and a personal story to it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And he, uh -huh. you know, and, and a lot of people don't know. Um, I suspect that much of our audience here knows, but but many people, when they think of Point du Hoc and the casualties the Rangers suffered, most of them are not, in fact, making that awful climb up the bluffs. As terrifying as that is, I think they took one killed and 15 wounded, right. something like that coming up. Their casualties come in the next 48 hours as they move across the road and they're trying to hold a position and block the road to the Germans, keep their position, and they're getting constant German counterattacks. And so uh, that is one of the things that makes that kind of such a heroic stand because it's I think it's two days before anybody comes to relieve them. Well, and I, you know, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Rick, go ahead. <laughs> that was interesting. Oh, no, I, <laughs> it was the ghost army behind you. He's creeping up on you now. Oh, oh. You know, keep in mind, I can cut your picture off at any time. <laughs> oh, we're having a problem with Chris's sound. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I was, just, I was just going to say, you're talking about Point to Hawk, and, and you were talking about um, how they suffer more casualties defending the point than getting to the point. Um, and that's one of those misconceptions. One of the other misconceptions, I think, is that maybe because of the movie, um, I don't know, but we focus on the guns that were were there or not there, um, as the case may be. But really, the more I look at that story, what strikes me as important about what Lampras and, and Lamel and all the Rangers do is they act as a speed bump uh, between um, uh, Grand Comp uh, and Omaha Beach, Verville. I mean, if, the, if um, they're not there, there's lots of Germans that can come reinforce the Germans that are trying to, to protect the Verville draw. Um, we all know yeah. that things aren't going really well for the 29th division there at the start of the, the landing. So um, I think that's another little component of the story that should probably maybe get a little bit more play. So I'll finish up with a little bit on, on Ted. He, um, he about a month after D-Day, uh, he steps on a landmine near Cherbourg and um, which he survives, I want to have quickly say. But the the army, I, I, he's one of the few people I've been able to get his full army record from because a lot of those records were burned in the fire in 75. Uh, and the army has a phrase for this. They said he had a traumatic amputation. <laughs> or as as Lapras said, he, he blew his foot off. Right. As opposed to um, a mild, slightly off-putting amputation. Yeah. And he was in the hospital, and his uh, commanding officer uh, wrote a letter to his mother. Uh, and I want to, uh, this isn't Rudder, this is uh, Captain Dick Merrill. Um, I'm not sure if it was his commander or his colleague, but he wrote a letter to Lapras's mother on July 28th after he'd had surgery and they knew he was going to make it. Please be assured, though, that Ted won't be handicapped either physically or mentally. During his stay in the hospital here, he was full of fun and continually cracking jokes, his usual self. One thing you don't know about is the great respect the men he led in combat have for him. In the army, we call what he had guts, and his men state freely that they never knew anyone who had more than he did. Which is a, a pretty good tribute. And he goes on, he goes to law school at Cornell. Right. And uh, he's there at Cornell, and you know, he's got one foot, right? right? He's got one foot and a prosthetic. But he goes to the coach of the hockey team at Cornell and says, can I skate with your team? Okay, I'll let the crippled veteran right. come in and skate with the team. A week later, the coach had his head in his hand. He said, I wish I had one player who could skate as well <laughs> and play as well as you can. Uh, uh, so the one-legged guy was skating circles around the rest of the Cornell hockey team. I think Ted Lapras was a tough dude. That's great. So. Well, I mean, along um, – well, I, I have another kind of – 
special operation I wanted to talk to. But but so I, before I do, um, uh, Robert had asked about a good book on Admiral King and uh, uh, watch this, Chris. Check check this out. Uh, oh, there we go. Right, we're yep. learning stuff every moment here. You man, I'm just gonna sit back and watch you. Uh, it's, um, it's, this is a blast. <laughs> Uh, and Mike has, has uh, spoke up and, and pointed out uh, he's right. Um, there you go. Uh, the Admirals um, has a lot about King. So check that out. Um, and the, you might also, um, if you've been on the Pacific trip or interested in that, obviously King, King looms pretty large in that story. So um, maybe we'll get to him a little bit later on another show if people still want to watch. Um, but the, along the lines, similar to what um, Rick was saying about um, Lampras and Point to Hawk, um, another one of those little actions, um, again, that lots of English people, uh, French people know about, but we as Americans don't, um, is the actions of 47 uh, Royal Marine Commando um, at Port and Besson. Um, for those of you who don't know um, or aren't aware of Port and Besson, is the junction point between the British and the American sectors of the beaches. Um, if you've traveled uh, to Normandy, it's kind of that in that dead ground that you go through when you've just left the American cemetery and you're driving really quickly to get to Pegasus Bridge and you go down by the British beaches and you go to Aramach. It's, it's in between the two beaches. Um, and we, again, we just kind of drive by it and don't think about it. Um, but that was a D-Day objective. Um, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one um, was that uh, it had been designated as the place that was going to be used to, to pump fuel across from, from England. Um, you may have heard of the underwater pipeline that was going to come out there. Also, uh, fuel stores brought across the channel by ship were going to be stored there and then sent on. Um, it was felt at the time that it wasn't large enough for a major uh, logistics spot, but it eventually becomes important. Um, it's also critically important because uh, Montgomery had talked about maybe uh, somewhere in that area setting up uh, his first um, CP uh, on French soil. But most importantly is the junction point between the two sectors. Again, you know, it's, it's great to, to, to land at these individual beaches, but unless you can link them all up, it, it's the, the invasion's not going to stick. So you have to, you have to have somebody land. So uh, the job is going to go uh, to 47 Royal Marine Commando, um, uh, 14 uh, landing craft, 30 men in a landing craft. Uh, they're going to come in at 7:30 um, at the the, the the rightmost flank of Gold Beach, and then they're going to basically land behind the the, the Gold Beach forces, hook a right, go behind the German gun battery at Long Sur Mare, which is that big battery that many people visit on the trip with the guns and the casemates and what have you, uh, and get into Port and Besson uh, that first day. Um, well, it doesn't really work out that way. Um, as they're coming ashore, uh, they wind up getting basically misdirected, um, being brought into the wrong landing spot, and mm -hmm. their commander um, makes the decision to turn all the landing crafts um, broadside to the beaches to bring his guys to the right spot, kind of similar to what happens to Rudder with the Rangers. Uh, they land very late. Uh, they land, uh, where they go is an area that hasn't been swept very adequately for mines. Um, and so they suffer, they begin to suffer casualties um, as they, they get to shore, they get to shore. Uh, and then they have a 12 mile hike behind enemy lines to get to their objective. Um, and uh, they, they spend the sixth just trying to get to Port and Basson. Um, and uh, they get to a piece of high ground just outside of the port um, when darkness comes. So they're, they're, they're stopped there. Um, and just so you, if you can't picture it, um, Port and Basson is, is flanked on either side by uh, 200 foot cliffs. Uh, right. where itself sits down kind of in this crack between the two. Um, the Germans have resistance nests on each of the pieces of high ground. They called it the west side, the east side, and then on the south side. Um, and so the commandos are going to have to advance into this. Um, in the course of 
the, the failed landing and their travel overland. They've used an awful lot of their supplies and equipment. Uh, they've gotten shot up very, very well. Um, it's one of the instances you read about uh, very infrequently, but happens here where they actually pick up German weapons and supplies as they're fighting across country because they have nothing else. Um, but early that next morning, they're going to begin uh, to attack. Um, they attack into the town. They get involved in this incredibly nasty fight, house-to-house uh, -house fighting in the town of Fort and uh, And then they have to take the high ground on either side. Uh, one party begins to go up the western uh, bluffs, uh, western side of the town, um, and they're then taking fire from from Germans on the eastern side of eastern position, and also two uh, flak boats, Kriegsmarine flak boats that fire up on these guys. Um, so uh, there's a Lieutenant Cousins who will eventually um, basically find they call it up the zigzag path, but he finds a way up the eastern um, side of the defenses. Uh, with just a handful of guys, uh, 25 guys to start. Um, he gets to the top and there's a series of bunkers up there and they're all still up there, uh, which is another nice thing. Um, yeah. You can see where the fighting was. Um, but uh, he kind of tries to get the, the high ground, fails a couple of times eventually. Um, uh, he will basically stand up and lead a charge uh, with four guys behind him. They said that everybody had their helmets on except for Cousins, he, he had his green beret on. Um, he's unfortunately killed uh, by a German grenade, but they take the position. Um, and then once they have that, then they can bring fire, support the troops on the other side of town, and they're eventually able to take the town uh, so that eventually it's going to be um, you know, troops from the 16th Infantry Regiment finally advancing from Omaha Beach that are going to link up with them. Uh, and that's where the British and the American sectors will finally join up. Um, so, but in the course of doing all of that, they're going to suffer about 50% casualties. Um, and uh, 47 Commando will continue uh, continue to fight after that fight. <clears throat> they get sent to um, uh, the, the left flank of the landings, and they're going to be thrown in to help the uh, British Airborne as they're holding that left flank of the penetration against all those armor attacks. Up by Pegasus Bridge. Yeah, exactly. And, and they get shot up pretty good. Um, and um, continue. Uh, they're involved uh, in operations up to the end of the war. And um, on VE Day of the what, 420 guys uh, that land on June 6th, um, there are 88 left with the commando by the end. So, um, again, you know, it, it's there are lots of stories like this, but again, it struck me as well, one of the things that struck me was. It's a nationalities thing, but there are just so many things that we as Americans don't know about D-Day and um, little stories that we should be maybe more aware of. Um, I thought, you know, it was interesting. And there's, and there's so many stories that get told over and over and over. Right. And, uh, and not that they're, they're, some of them are really good stories and worth telling. Um, Absolutely. But, but there's stories that are, that, that uh, whether it's a heroism or, you know, thinking about Freddie Morgan and and uh, and thinking about Bertram Ramsey and sort of saying, I whatever the politics, I'm I'm going to do the what's right because it's a life or death situation and you don't really you know you can't indulge in the politics. I think that's all stuff that's really you know good and important to remember. Well, and again, I think the other thing is, and I I mentioned this to you. I mentioned it on all my tours. One of the things that I find so compelling about the stories are that um, it's proof that that an individual person still has agency in these situations. You know, it's easy when you're reading all this stuff about 150,000 men and 3,000 ships, whatever the numbers are, you can get lost in just the scale of it all. But at the end of the day, it very often is just one person who says no yeah. or says yes. Um, and I, I find it compelling and interesting, but I also find it comforting. Well, and maybe now when we're all sitting at home, you know, feeling a little bit lost in the whole uh, situation that's going on right now, you know, that's a good reminder. And the time might come where one person's actions can can make some difference on, you know, whether it's on their block or, or in right. a larger sphere. Um, and, you know, you sort of have to wait for that moment. Um, uh, before, I, before we leave this subject, I just, I saw a comment here from Ross. Um, 
uh, what was the 47th Commandos operation known as? Um, I should say it was 47 Royal Marine Commandos, uh, and it was Operation Aubrey. Um, A-U-B-R-E-Y? Yeah, A-U-B-R-E-Y. All right. So that was their component of it. Um, so if you want to look that up. And there's a very, very good book. Uh, it's called From D-Day to the Scheldt. Uh, and it's written by the uh, the commando surgeon. He's with them for the whole war. Um, and you get it on Amazon or online. So in our last few minutes here, uh, we're going to completely uh, change the topic and change uh, what we're doing. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I should say that this was Chris's idea to begin with. So um, uh, <clears throat> unless it works, in which case, no, I think then I'll happily take credit for it. No, I think it's a great idea. History said, Chris said, you know, we both live, Chris lives in London. Um, I live in Chicago. Well, we're sort of semi-housebound at the moment. We like to get out and about in our neighborhoods. And Chris said, well, we should do some sort of history around us segment because everybody has history around us. And we can talk about ours and then maybe um, uh, other people can, can share some ideas that we can make part of uh, the episode in future weeks. And this has nothing to do, at least as far as I know, Chris, with World War II. Nothing with um, our... Okay, just, just confirming that there wasn't some weird connection here. But I'll let you go first uh, and talk about history around us a little bit. And I've got your photos ready so I can um, help you out there. And, Scott, we see your question, and we'll, we'll answer you offline on that, if that's okay. Okay. Oh, right. sorry. History oh. around us. Yeah, no, I, I didn't know if you're going to put the, the picture up. So um, oh, yeah. I, I go for a, a quick walk around uh, the house as far as they'll let me go in my period of confinement. Uh, and so just down the street from me, uh, you may see a white building there. It's um, maybe a 10-minute walk from my house. Um, and uh, if you saw it a little bit larger, you would see a blue plaque. There we go. Uh, the blue plaque is it was uh, the home of Edward Elgar, who you may recognize some of his tunes. I'm sorry, I'm doing. Uh, oh, that's the yeah. blue plaque. Okay. Yep. So that's the door. Like the wrong side. Yeah. Oh, sorry, green plaque. Green plaque. Uh, but above the doorway, perhaps most famously, is Abbey Road Studios, where those four wacky kids from Liverpool recorded an album. And uh, ever since then, uh, the traffic is really bad. If you go to the crosswalk, there's always traffic because people want to get their pictures there, and it drives the, uh, the, there you go, drives the pedestrians crazy. Uh, so one of the sayings amongst all the people here in Maida Vale is if you're ever late for a meeting, just throw up your hands and say, oh, I drove by Abbey Road and the damn tourists, you know, they blocked the road. So I, I'm late. I'm sorry. Uh, and so there's nobody off, there now. <laughs> often used excuse. So there's. And it's empty now. And it's empty. So yeah, you can, you can do laps around Abbey Road. There's, so there's nobody crossing there. And so it was the home of Edward Elgar. Yeah. The the composer. Yes. The composer. Yeah. I have I have a fact correct. Always amazing. Um, I had no idea that I did not know that part. That is very very cool. Yeah. Um, and so uh, all right. So I'm going to um, um, I'm working on the uh, the graphics here, um, and I have uh, something to show you, which is uh, down the street from me. And it is the, uh, I live on Michigan Avenue in Chicago, and down the street is a building which is the former studio of Chess Records. And Chess Records is at 2120 South Michigan Avenue. Uh, so it's a little less than a mile from here. It's not a big tourist spot, um, but it was an R&B label, um, and they actually had several different locations. This was their location from 57 to 65. So they have a lot of uh, they're very well known about among R&B aficionados, and one of some of the R&B aficionados who really um, knew about and liked Chess Records was another band from England um, who came to the U.S. on their first tour in 1964 before they performed the song and recorded the song Satisfaction. But it was the Rolling Stones, and the Rolling Stones made a pilgrimage to Chess Records here at 2120 South Michigan Avenue. And they recorded four songs here down the block from me, one of which is an instrumental, which is called 2120 That's South Michigan Avenue. That's the title of it. 
Um, you can't find it on iTunes, but but I found it, Chris. And this, I'm serious. This is not a joke. This is all serious. It's absolutely true. Do, I can try to play it for you if you like. Well, well, please. Let's, let's see how it goes here. We, we're now we're getting into a whole new level of. Can you hear it? I can. I kept the volume low so it wouldn't overwhelm us. Now, did they go there because they couldn't get any time at Abbey Road? I don't know, but that's <laughs> but that's the uh, let's, let's get rid of this one. All right, there we go. It's got that '60s groove. Yeah. So that could be our credits music for today. <laughs> it could be. Mystery Happy Hour brought to you by Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Um, hey, next week we are going to do this again next week at the same time. I hope so. Yeah. Um, we uh, we hope you'll come and join us, and uh, we're going to have at least one guest next week. We're going to invite on uh, Yakir Katz, who is the um, owner, right? Owner of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. He's the boss, he's the boss and he's uh, got a family connection to Stephen Ambrose, and you can talk about that and how the company got started because we know people are often interested in that. And uh, we may have some other guests on next week too. We're, we're we're starting to feel a little bit more comfortable with things, so we'll see if we can up the game a little bit. Well, and I I want to say too. Um, obviously, you know, please send us your questions uh, on those emails, and we'll answer them through the week. Uh, anything you have yeah. uh, live, you know, we didn't get to shoot Rick or I uh, an email. Um, and since this was, can I say it was my idea? Since it worked out all right. Um, sure. Please, uh, as far as your quarantine will let you go, uh, history happens all around us. So if there's a cool spot that you can walk to with your dog on your allowed one hour out, uh, go and take a picture and send it to us. Tell us a little bit about it, and we'll talk about where history happened near you. Absolutely. I think that would be really fun and awesome. Yeah. And, um, so, yeah. So thank you very much. This has been History Happy Hour, and we will see you next week. Appreciate it. Same time, same bad channel. All right. Woo. Now I have to mute us because they can still hear us. <laughs> or we can keep talking over the curve. <laughs> this would be people say that was the most interesting part when they kept talking. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do Mystery Science Theater. We'll play a war movie and just talk about it. It's, they can still hear us. If they're still there. The smart ones are still there. Thank you, Ronald. Appreciate the comment. Thank you, Brian. And Ross says, remember when HHH used to play music? Does he mean Hubert Horatio Humphrey? I'm not sure. But uh, Lord, you, please do hang in there. What will happen? Thank you, Gary Ann and Cindy and Lori. Really appreciate Ron, Ronald Stassen. Appreciate everything, guys. Bob, Scott. All right. Signing off for real. Farewell. <laughs>